Okay, so let's finish up our discussion of using definite integrals to construct geometric quantities. So, so far we have seen how definite integrals can be used to find the area of a planar region. Uh, we have used them to construct the volumes of solids of revolution. And we, most recently we have used them to find the length of a curve. So the final topic that we're going to cover, although of course there are uncountably many more, uh, is finding the area of a surface. So, you know, when you have a solid of revolution, uh, we know how to find the volume of it, if it's well behaved enough. We now want to ask what the surface area of such a shape will be. So, the general setup is, suppose we have a curve represented by the graph of a differentiable function for values of x inside some interval. So in the last section, we saw that we could find the length of that curve by breaking it into small pieces. And if those pieces are sufficiently small, then we can assume that the function is approximately linear on those pieces. So if we've broken it up into a, if we've broken it up into a bunch of line segments, we know how to find the length of a line segment. So to get the length of the whole thing, we just integrate all of the lengths of those little line segments. So in particular, we find that uh, the length of the little line segment dl is given by this quantity here, where this here is the derivative of the function. That's why we, we require that it's differentiable. And like I said, the length of the whole curve is then obtained by integrating up this quantity, by adding up the lengths of all those little line segments. So we're going to use a similar idea when it comes to finding the area of the surface of revolution. So let's start with maybe the, uh, the simplest case that we can imagine. Let's suppose first that the function uh, whose curve we are rotating is linear so that the graph is just a line segment. So if we take a line segment and rotate that about the x-axis, say, what sort of shape are we going to get? Well, we're going to get a section of a cone called a conical frustum. So a conical frustum is a cone, but the tip has been chopped off so that it's just a section of a cone. Uh, so let me show you what that looks like so that you don't have to just take my word for it. So uh, let's take the graph of a line. Let's say f of x equals x. So that's just the ordinary 45 degree line. And let's specify, say, values of x between 1 and 2. Right? So that gives us just a line segment. So if we take this line segment and rotate it around the x-axis, I claim that we are going to get a section of a cone. So if you can't see that in your head, let's go ahead and just do it in GeoGebra. So this is the same technique that I've been using to, to construct solids of revolution. So surface, let's see, so GeoGebra is calling this line segment G. So G, N is the angle that we're turning it around, and we're turning it around the x-axis. Remember, uh, it needs to be capitalized there. So if we turn this around, Indeed, you can see that this is a section of a cone. Like you can imagine the cone coming down to a point here, uh, uh, you know, along the rest of the line. But since we're only taking a line segment, instead of getting the full cone, we just get a section of the cone. So this sort of shape is called a conical frustum. And using just theorems from ordinary geometry, uh, we can figure out what the area of this surface is. So when I say area, I'm referring to the area of just the outside bit. So the circle, that is uh, one of its bases, and the big circle, that's its other base, we're, we're disregarding those. Uh, those are not part of the surface. The only part of the surface is, is this conical bit here. So we are excluding the two circular bases. Uh, so 
from ordinary geometry, you can find that the surface area of a conical frustum is given by this formula. So pi times the radius of one of the bases plus the radius of the other base times the slant length. So in our case, R1, uh, R1 is this length, right? That's the radius of one of the bases. R2 is this length. That's the radius of the other base. And S, the slant length, is this length. It is the length of the, uh, the side portion uh, in a two-dimensional view. So, in fact, you, you really don't need the whole three-dimensional picture in order to get these, because even if you were just looking at the two-dimensional picture here, uh, we see that R1 is this length, R2 is this length, and then S is the length of the actual line segment. So, in our case, we obtain that R1 is the value of the function at A, R2 is the value of the function at B, right? It's literally the, uh, it, it's literally the height of the curve. And then the slant length is, in fact, the arc length of, of the graph, which in our case was just the length of a line segment. So that's the simplest case that, that we can get when the function is completely linear. So in the general case, then, when the function is not necessarily linear, but it is differentiable, our strategy then is going to be to look at small sections of the graph where, you know, if you zoom in on it far enough, the graph looks approximately linear. So it's the same sort of idea as before, where how do you find the arc length of a curve? Well, you break it into pieces that are approximately linear. How do you find the surface area of a surface of revolution? Well, break it down into pieces where each piece is approximately a frustum. And since we know the area of a frustum, we can then integrate up all of those little uh, frustal areas. Right? I mean, this is the common theme in using definite integrals to construct quantities, is you sort of deal with the simplest case first, and then you obtain the general case by adding up a whole bunch of approximators, where the approximators are derived from the simplest case. So in this case, we are assuming that the entire surface area is constructed out of small conical frusta. And then we add up the areas of all those little frusta, uh, which is what I say here. So yep, so assume that the function is linear on small subintervals. Uh, so in particular, let us look at the section of the graph connecting these two points. So connecting x, y, so that's just a, an, an arbitrary point on the graph, to x plus dx, y plus dy, which is another point on the graph that's really, really close to it, right? As indicated by the infinitesimal increments, uh, dx and dy in the x and y directions, respectively. So if dx and dy are small enough, then the portion of the graph connecting these two points is a line segment, right? That's, that's our assumption. That's what differentiable means. Uh, so what is the length of this line segment? Well, it's dl, and we have a formula for that. It's the same exact formula that we got last time. Consequently, if we take this little line segment, the line segment connecting these two points, and rotate it around the x-axis, whoops, rotated about the x-axis, then we obtain a small, a very, very, very thin conical frustum where the slant length is dl. Uh, and the radius, so the first radius is the value of the function at one of the uh, endpoints of the segment. So in other words, one of the radii is y, and the other radius is the value of the function at the other end of the endpoint, which is y plus dy. So in this case, r1 and r2 are y and y plus dy, and the slant length is dl. So y plus dy becomes 2y times pi times dl to get 2 pi y dl, and then 
here's the rest of it, pi dy dl. All I did here is I just distributed. So this is the area of one of the tiny little approximating conical frusta. So how do we deal with this term here, this dy dl? So recall from the discussion of the shell method last time that if we have an infinitesimal, so you know, some d quantity, we can regard that as being the smallest measurement that we can possibly make. The smallest possible measurement that we can make. So if you take a number that is that small and then square it, it gets even smaller. So if, 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 the, in, if the infinitesimal is already as small as the smallest thing that we can measure, then its square is so small as to be unmeasurable. Hence, we can take the square of an infinitesimal and set it equal to zero. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's valid. Well, same sort of argument here. Here we have a product, dy and dl. This is a product of two infinitesimals. So since these two guys are already as small as the smallest thing that we can measure, their product is going to be an order of magnitude smaller, and therefore unmeasurable. So we are justified, at least in an intuitive sense, by taking this, uh, in taking this product dy dl and setting it equal to zero. So that's what we do. We just take this latter term and ignore it. And again, I want to emphasize that this is not a strictly rigorous argument. This is an argument based on, you know, ideas of measurement. Uh, uh, you know, this is an argument that is appealing to our physical intuition, and that's not, that's not strictly the way that mathematics works. But the formulas that we end up getting are correct. Uh, and if you're interested, you know, you can find uh, uh, the real proofs of them. Uh, elsewhere. But I don't think going through the trouble of presenting a perfectly correct proof is, is very enlightening. So uh, the point being that you take the surface, you, 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 you take the surface of revolution, you cut it up into little slices. Each slice is approximately a conical frustum, and the area of that conical frustum is given by this. So 2 pi y dl. And this is if we're rotating it about the x-axis. So we obtain the area of the whole surface by integrating this quantity, whereby we obtain the boxed statement down here. So the area of the surface of revolution formed by rotating the graph y equals f of x about the x-axis is, well, it's what you get when you integrate this dude. So 2 pi is a constant, so I pulled that out. Y well, y is equal to f of x, so instead of writing y, I wrote f of x. And dl, well, dl is all of this stuff. So I put that in as well. And, and that's where this big, ugly formula comes from. It's, yeah. Another way you can think about it is like 2 pi y. Well, if y is like the radius of... Because you can think, if, if you're cutting the surface of revolution up, you're, you're sort of cutting it into rings. So the circumference of that ring would be 2 pi y. So this is one way that you can remember it. It's you're taking the circumference of the slice and then multiplying it by this, this dl term. Uh, yeah, so that's the formula that you get when you're rotating about the x-axis and when you're given y equals a function of x. If... On the other hand, oops, I should say area. Uh, if, on the other hand, you are given a function of the form, or you are given a curve, which can be written in the form x equals a function of y, well, the difference then is that the variable of integration has to be y, so we have to make, we have to make that change. So notice, then, that we are integrating up this quantity, 2 pi y dl. Well, if the variable of integration is y, then... It's, it's y. We, we don't have to rewrite that. We don't have to write f of x instead, because y is now the variable that we're integrating. Uh, as for the dl segment, that's, that's the same, just, you know, with 
with Y instead of X. Uh, yeah, so that's that's it. That's the formula. So this is for rotating about the x-axis. If we wanted to rotate about the y-axis instead, uh, we would go through the same exact argument. And the only real difference is that instead of having 2 pi y dl, we have 2 pi x dl. And then we get the same sort of uh, uh, conclusion down here. So if you're rotating about the y-axis and you were given an equation in the form y equals f of x, then, well, 2 pi x dl, 2 pi x dl. If, on the other hand, you were given x equals f of y, then you're integrating 2 pi x dl, so 2 pi x, but x is equal to f of y, so since the variable of integration is y, we then have to plug in uh, uh, the function here, and then this whole chunk here is the dl. And that pretty much covers all of the cases that you will be asked to look at. Um, I mean, of course, you can ask the question of what it's like if you, you know, what the surface area is if you rotate about some other axis of rotation. You know, here we're only talking about the x-axis and the y-axis. You could talk about other lines in general, um, but they, they don't really do any examples like that in the book. So you, you will not be required to, to take it any further than than what is presented here. In any case, you would use the same line of argument, you know, from, from geometry. You know, you cut it into frusta and then integrate up the areas of the frusta. And the formula might end up being different, but, you know, same, same core idea. Okay, so there's really not too much to to talk about in this section because you're basically just using one of these formulas and then calling it a day. So let's just do some examples and then uh, that'll be it for this section. <clears throat> Alrighty, so the curve y equals root 4 minus x squared for values of x between negative 1 and positive 1 is rotated about the x-axis. Find the area of the resulting surface. Okay, so just just for the sake of curiosity, uh, let's see what this actually looks like. We don't strictly need the picture. It's not like volumes where, you know, you have to ask yourself, okay, should I take vertical slices or horizontal slices? Uh, this, I think, is much more straightforward. You're just plugging it into one of the formulas. But so that we understand exactly what it is we're doing, let me, let me make the picture at least once. And it's easy enough to do in GeoGebra anyway. So here's the function, root 4 minus x squared. And we are interested only in um, values of x between negative 1 and positive 1. So this is the curve that we're looking at. Let's get our angle slider ready. Okay, and then if we rotate this about the x-axis, uh, we're going to end up getting a portion of a sphere, because this guy already was a portion of a circle. Okay, so this is the surface whose area we are trying to find, this surface here. And again, we are neglecting the top and the bottom circles, so, so those are not part of the surface, just as a matter of convention. Okay, so let's see. Uh, which of these examples, or, or which of these four formulas is appropriate for this case? So we are rotating it about the x-axis. Okay, so it's going to be one of these. And we have been given an equation in the form y equals f of x y equals f of x. Okay, so it has to be this one. It has to be this first one. So 2 pi uh, integral f of x root 1 plus f prime squared. So first off, let's find the derivative of f, because we're definitely going to need that. So what is the derivative of root 4 minus x squared? So we're going to have to use the chain rule here. So 
So uh, square root is a power of one half, so we start by doing the power rule. Like so. But then we have to multiply by the derivative of 4 minus x squared, which is negative 2x. Okay, so that's just the chain rule. And let us clean that up a little bit, because this 2 and this 2 are going to cancel. So we have negative uh, x over root 4 minus x squared. Okay. So I just took this negative 1 half and turned that into um, uh, 1 over square root. Uh, 2 and 2 canceled. I brought the negative out front, and I put the x on the top. So that is that. Now, as for the surface area, so integral from negative 1 to 1. So f of x, so I need to plug in. Okay. <laughs> okay, so f of x, square root, 1 plus, and then f prime squared. So there it is. So this is tremendously ugly. But uh, let's simplify it, and I, I do believe that this one is actually going to end up being pretty easy once you actually simplify it a bit. So let's see. We've got a square root and a square root. So a product of square roots is equal to a square root of a product. So that means uh, we could just put everything underneath one big square root. Now, minus x squared becomes positive x squared, so that negative sign gets squared away. As for down here, the square root gets squared away. So we have that. Okay, now I'm going to take this 4 minus x squared and distribute it. So nothing terribly interesting to say now. Now we're just doing algebra and this problem was contrived in such a way that it, it, it ends up being pretty simple, even though the initial expression was tremendously ugly. So 4 minus x squared times 1 is 4 minus x squared, plus 4 minus x squared times x squared over 4 minus x squared. Well, the 4 minus x squareds cancel, so we just have x squared left over. And, oh, well, how convenient. Minus x squared plus x squared, those guys cancel each other out. Oops. <laughs> Am I going to get any better at typing throughout this semester? Uh, spoiler, spoiler alert. No, I'm not. I'm not going to get much better at talking either. So let's see. Minus x squared plus x squared. Those cancel. Square root of 4 is 2. Well, may as well pull that out. So, what is the antiderivative of 1? Because you can imagine that there's a 1 here. What's the antiderivative of 1? Well, that's just x. So x evaluated at 1, x evaluated at negative 1. That is uh, 1 minus negative 1. So 1 minus negative 1 is 2. So 2 times 4 pi is 8 pi. So there we go. That's all there is to it. We didn't have to end up, you know, we basically didn't anti-differentiate anything. Uh, like the entirety of the integrand just ended up getting canceled, which is convenient. Okay. Next. The arc of the parabola, y equals x squared, uh, in between these two points, 1, 1, and 2, 4, is rotated about the y-axis. Find the area of the resulting surface. Okay, so let's see which of those, these formulas we're going to use. 
we're rotating about the y-axis, so that means we need to use the second box. And we are given y equals a function of x. Okay, so that's going to be this one. That's going to be this one. So just an x out front instead of an f of x, right? That's the main difference. Here we had an f of x out front. Here we have an x. Uh, and then, well, all of this junk. So first, let's take the derivative. So here the function is x squared, so the derivative is just 2x. So that's easy. Uh, let's see. The variable of integration is x, so here x is ranging from 1 to 2. And then x square root 1 plus derivative squared. Okay. So uh, 2x squared is just 4x squared. Oops. All right. So uh, we can tackle this guy by doing a u substitution. In particular, uh, let us let u be all of the stuff underneath the square root. So u is equal to 1 plus 4x squared. So in the substitution technique, once you have u, you find the derivative. So du dx is equal to a, the 1 goes to 0, 4x squared becomes 8x. Consequently, dx is equal to 1 over 8x du, right? And then we're going to take this value of dx and plug it in up here. Uh, let's see, we also have to deal with the bounds. So let's see, when x is equal to 1, u is equal to 1 plus 4 times 1 squared, which is uh, 1 plus 4, which is 5. So that's going to be the new lower bound. When x is equal to 2, u is going to be 1 plus 4 times 2 squared. So that's... Um, 2 squared is 4, 4 times 4 is 16, plus 1 is 17. So that's going to be the new upper bound. So from 5 up to 17. Uh, x square root u. And then instead of dx, I'm going to put all of this. Okay. And well, how convenient. This x here and this x down here cancel each other out. So we end up with an integral that has only u's in it, which is exactly what we need, right? That is that is what we want in the substitution rules. We want to end up uh, with an integral that has only u's in it. Or whatever integral we or whatever variable we choose. It doesn't have to be u, but u is traditional. So these x's cancel. I've got a 1 8 that I can pull out. So let's see, 2 pi over 8 is uh, pi over 4. And I just have a root u left over. Okay. So what's the antiderivative of this? Well, that is, so this is u to the 1 half, so that becomes u to the 3 halves. Uh, times two-thirds. That is evaluated between 5 and 17. Uh, 2 over 4. So let's see, we can clean this up a little bit. So this becomes pi over 2. 2 times 3 is 6. So this all just becomes pi over 6. There we go. And just in case you want to be pedantic, 
So uh, for for some for some bizarre reason, the book and consequently the homework problems, which are being taken from from like uh, uh, like a pool of problems that are associated with the book, for whatever reason, they don't like powers of three halves. So instead, uh, they would write it like this. So instead of 17 to the 3 halves, they would write 17 root 17. And instead of 5 to the 3 halves, they would write they would write 5 root 5. So that's dumb. Doesn't make any difference to me. But all the same, if you see like a multiple choice question in the homework, um, you know, they're, they're, they're probably going to write it like this. And in any case, like, it's good to know that that's some algebra that you can do, even if I don't think it's particularly important. Like... You should at least see that these are the same thing. <laughs> like that is like going from here to here, that is some algebra that you should be capable of doing. Even if I don't think it's particularly interesting or Yeah, anyway. Uh okay. So in this final example, uh, I am just asking to set up the integral, so don't bo don't bother actually evaluating it. Uh, just set up an integral for the area of the surface obtained by rotating the curve x equals y plus y cubed for values of y between 0 and 1 about a, the x-axis, and b, the y-axis. Okay, so let's do uh, a first. So if we're rotating about the y-axis, so we're rotating about the y-axis, and we have x equals a function of y. So x-axis, x equals a function of y. So that means we need to use this formula, this one. So 2 pi, integral, y, all of that junk. So first off, it... so, so first off, let's just find the derivative, because that's going to be useful for both a and b. Um, so that is 1 plus 3y squared. Okay, so there's that. So for a, if we're rotating it about the x-axis, we have 2 pi integral from 0 to 1. What was it again? x. So x-axis, x equals a function of y. Okay, so just y y root 1 plus, and then the derivative, uh, then the derivative squared. And we can clean this up a little bit. Uh, we can clean this up a little bit just by squaring, by squaring this dude here. So we get one plus uh, one plus three y squared plus three y squared. So that's six y squared plus nine y to the fourth. Oops, plus. And then one plus one is two. So let's just push those together. Uh, yep. Yeah. And I I don't see any reason to take it any farther than that. Incidentally, I'm, I don't I don't know if it's actually even possible to to do this integral uh, uh, analytically. This so so there is an entire class of integrals called elliptic integrals uh, that arise out of formulas that look like this, formulas that have a big square root and a polynomial underneath them. Uh, and I don't I don't exactly know what the criterion is. Um, it has something to do with like the roots. Of the polynomial under the square root, but um, as it happens, most integrals of this form are just impossible. <laughs> like it's actually impossible to find an antiderivative by hand. Like you just have to do it numerically. So this this might be one of those. Uh, next, so if we're rotating it about the y-axis, so y-axis x equals a function of y. So we have to use this formula. 
So the principal difference now is that in front of the square root, we now have to put the entire function. But everything else is the same. Yeah, everything else is the same. So this, this whole term is unchanged. What? Why is it so hard to pick up the square root and nothing else? There we go. It's very finicky. There we go. So, yep, not, nothing else to say about that. <laughs> Still don't know how to integrate this. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that it's possible. So, yep. So that's surface areas. There, there's really not much to it. It's, it's you, you just use one of these formulas. And then chances are that unless, unless the problem is really, really, really uh, 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 contrived, um, the integral that you actually get is going to be impossible. So, yeah. So, so I can see myself putting a question where it's like, just set up the integral and then don't bother trying to evaluate it. Uh, or, or else it's, it's going to be something that you know is, is going to simplify, or you know is going to be fairly simple. Like in this case, this, this guy might look confusing at first, but I mean, there, there's only so many techniques that we have under our belt at this point. So you see this big square root, you see that the question is asking you to actually evaluate it. Well, my mind would immediately go to U substitution. Right, because it's like, what other techniques do we possibly have that can attack the sky? It's got to be U substitution. We we don't we don't have anything else at this point. So yep. All right, so that's all for this section.